Good evening. Welcome to the University of Houston Clear Lake. Uh, we're delighted that you took time out of what we know are busy schedules to be here at the university tonight. Uh, my name is Bill Staples. I'm president of the university, and it's uh, my pleasure to make one introduction, who, and that person will then in turn introduce our keynote speaker. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizations who have been sponsors for this event. You've seen uh, the names uh, flashed on the screen. Uh, the GHG Corporation, whose president is Israel Galvan, uh, they are a primary sponsor of this event. Uh, additional sponsors within the University of Houston Clear Lake are School of Business, our School of Science and Computer Engineering, our Office of Sponsored Programs, and all of this was ably put together from a staff point of view by our Office of University Advancement. I also want to express my appreciation to a very special guest we have with us this evening, and that person is the director of the Johnson Space Center, Mr. Mike Coates, and we're delighted that he took time out of his busy schedule to, to be with us. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce the program chair of our physics program here at the University of Houston Clear Lake, Dr. David Garrison. He is not only the program chair of physics, he's an associate professor of physics. He earned his bachelor's degree at MIT in physics and his doctoral degree in physics from Penn State University. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. David Garrison. All right, I'd like to start off by thanking Dr. Staples for that introduction, and I'd like to thank the audience for attending, and I'd also like to thank um, the Office of University Advancement and the uh, faculty of the Division of Natural Sciences for helping to uh, put together this event. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to just quickly uh, let everybody know that in many ways this is the kickoff of our spring seminar series. And every year for about six years now, we've, uh, we've had a weekly seminar series in physics where we've covered different aspects of astronomy, space science, and physics. And uh, these talks are going to be held every Monday evening in uh, Bayou uh, 1211. And there are schedules outside at the physics booth as well as information about our programs here. And so uh, these talks are free to attend, but we do offer, uh, also offer university credit for those who are interested in attending. Now, um, this year, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dr. H John Hawley as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Hawley is a professor of astronomy, and he's also chair of the astronomy department at the University of Virginia. He received his PhD in astronomy in 1984 from the University of Illinois, and he's a he was a Bentrell Fellow in Theoretical Physics at the California Institute of Technology. And after that, he joined the uh, faculty at the uh, Department of Astronomy at University of Virginia in 1987. His research interests include computational simulation and black hole astrophysics. He received the 1993 L.N.B. Warren Award uh, for the American Astronomical Society for his contributions in astrophysical theory. And so I think he has a really fascinating talk this evening, and so I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. John Hawley. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly have a fascinating topic. We'll see whether I have a fascinating talk or not. I'm uh, used to uh, addressing a fairly large group, uh, but normally they all sit in the back, so thank you for, <laughs> for sitting up front. All right, so I didn't realize that this uh, thing was on my computer. Huh, what do you know? I didn't even know I had that presentation. Oops, let's, let's go to the, let's go to the show then. All right. So the title of this talk is uh, Black Holes, the Powerhouse of the Universe. And the idea here, uh, of course people have heard of black holes, but they don't realize that black holes in fact, uh, 
Everyone knows black holes don't produce any light, but in fact, black holes are responsible for an enormous amount of energy that's put out in the universe. So they are, in fact, one of the most, uh, in fact, the most powerful source of energy that we have in the universe for, for producing the most exotic astrophysical phenomena. So it's worth getting to know what black holes are capable of. Um, <clears throat> let's begin with the, uh, the universe. Here's a view looking towards the center of the galaxy. This is um, how humanity came to study the universe is by looking at the stars. If you go out at night, you look up, you see stars, that then is the universe, a universe of stars. And slowly through the years and years as humanity, humans thought about uh, the cosmos and they thought about stars, they, they wanted to understand what stars did, what stars were up to, they wanted to understand the universe. And so the story tonight is a, a story about the gradual realization that there's a lot more going out there than, than in stars. Now, the first thing that uh, one has to do in trying to understand the, the cosmos, aside from looking at it, is to try to understand what's going on up there. And to do that, we have to understand basically what governs the motions of things. This is what the ancient Greek astronomers were so interested in. Why does the moon move the way it does? Why does the sun move the way that it does? What about those strange planets that wander around through the sky? What governs their motions? It turns out the answer is uh, fairly simple and applies to governing the evolution of the universe of, at, uh, of a whole, and that answer is the theory of gravity. Gravity really is the dominant force to, which determines how the universe as a whole operates. And so we're going to start tonight by thinking just a little bit about the history of the theory of gravity and how that came to, to be uh, understood. And of course, uh, in starting with the theory of gravity, we start with this person, Isaac Newton, who, of course, everybody's heard of Newton. Um, here's a few of the things he did. He invented calculus. Uh, he invented the reflecting telescope. As part of his study of optics, he realized that the white light that emits from the sun is actually broken up into colors. Uh, he derived the laws of mechanics, how things move, Newton's laws of motion. And he also figured out the law of gravity, which determines how gravity operates. And he did all this stuff when he was in his, basically in his mid-twenties. So he had all this stuff done before he reached the age of 30. Now. I mentioned that in case some of you are feeling sort of smug about your accomplishments. Uh, <laughs> or perhaps uh, some of you younger people who are thinking about the sort of things they might accomplish in the next few years. If you use Newton as your standard, uh, well, you'll be most impressive indeed. This is why Newton is often regarded as perhaps the greatest scientist uh, that of all time is, is because of his accomplishments and the fact that he was able to realize uh, in a sort of a complete form, the laws of motion, Newton's laws of motion. Well, as I said, we're, uh, we're considering the issue of gravity, and everybody knows Newton figured out gravity. Um, and what did Newton actually figure out? Well, if you've thought about it, perhaps you thought that what Newton realized was that there was gravity, okay, which tends to suggest that up until that point in history, nobody had ever noticed that things fall down and that Newton was sitting there one day and uh, an apple hit him on the head and he said, hey, there's gravity here. Things fall down. Well, it's not quite what he figured out. What he actually figured out, and here's a, a quote from uh, Newton, uh, which is that uh, he was trying to figure out what kept the moon in orbit around the Earth. You know, why does the moon stay up there moving around as it does? Because he realized in his laws of motion that the natural motion should be in a straight line. But the moon was moving forever in a circle around the Earth. So something had to be bending the motion of the moon from a straight line into a circle. And that would, you know, there had to be something doing that. And he was supposedly, he, this is a story he told, was that he looked out at a, a tree and he saw an apple fall. And he said, well, you know, things fall. You know, there's a force that's produced by the Earth which makes things fall. What if, and this was the moment of brilliance, he realized, what if that force goes from the ground here, you know, we're used to it getting the apple, but what if it goes all the way up to the moon? And it pulls on the moon, 
and tries to make the moon fall down, but instead the moon goes on around the Earth. And so the, it's this gravity force, which you know we don't know why it's there, but it's produced by the Earth, it's produced by massive things. This gravity force is actually pulling the moon into its orbit around the Earth. And so his realization was that gravity doesn't just operate in the orchard to bring the apples down to the ground. It actually operates out into space and into the distance as far as you could imagine. So it's this notion of universal gravity, that gravity works throughout the universe and extends out to infinity and, in fact, then must govern the motions of all the planets and the stars and everything else out there. Okay, the next thing about gravity is that he was able to figure out a certain law for exactly how gravity works. And one of the consequences of the law is uh, something here which I, I list that's the escape velocity from a planet. Okay, so the amazing thing about gravity, here's sort of an amazing thing about gravity. I'm standing here on the ground, sort of. Well, it's not quite the ground. It's a little above the ground, but it's not making too much of a difference. I've got the entire Earth pulling on me, okay, which the Earth is big. It's a lot more massive than I am. So the entire mass of the Earth is pulling on me, and yet I'm able to temporarily at least push myself away from it. The gravity force just isn't that big. Okay. There's something called an escape velocity, which is if, you know, if I jump hard enough, in this case about 11 kilometers per second, and there you know, wasn't a ceiling here, uh, then I could actually leave the Earth. Because my acceleration upwards, my speed upwards, would be great enough that by the time the Earth could pull me back down, I would escape. And so that's how fast you have to get rockets going in order to get them to leave the Earth. They have to be going faster than the escape velocity. Um, and the thing about the escape velocity is it depends both on the mass of the Earth and its size. If you make the mass bigger, the escape velocity becomes larger. It's harder to get away from. And the other thing is if you shrink, take the same mass of the Earth, but you shrink it down to a smaller size, it becomes more intense. And that, too, would make the escape velocity get bigger. Now, in the late 1700s, somebody sort of fooling around with this notion realized an interesting thing, which was that if you took an object of a certain mass m and you shrunk it down to a ridiculous size, the escape velocity would actually be equal to the speed of light. Okay, And so in that case, something not even light would have enough velocity to get away from its surface. Now, the reason I said it's sort of ridiculous is that uh, you know, you, you, the sun is very big, and it's got a lot more mass than the Earth. And so this size that you'd have to shrink it down to is about uh, three kilometers. Okay, so it fits nicely, uh, you know, just down here sort of on, I guess, it would fit nicely into NASA's property here. Uh, so that's the whole sun. Now, if you take the Earth and you want to do this, shrink it down to about that size, a ping pong ball. Okay, well, that's kind of ridiculous. So the thinking goes. And so people thought this was kind of a neat idea that maybe there could be these massive objects out there in space that were so dense that not even light could escape from them. But they, it's hard to take this too seriously because how could an object get shrunk down to that such a compact size? Well, so this was the notion of a Newtonian dark star. And it was sort of just a, an interesting notion that was tossed out in uh, the late 1700s. Now. I said that Newton was uh, uh, regarded as one of the top great scientists of all time, if not the top great scientist. Well, there's at least one other guy in the running for a title of really good scientist, at least. And that's this guy, Albert Einstein. Now, most people know that Albert Einstein came up with some theory of relativity. And everybody knows that the theory of relativity is really confusing. And mysterious and complicated, okay? And it must be the case that Einstein was a genius because he's the only one who ever understood what the theory of relativity was about. <laughs> All right, now, what motivated Einstein was the notion that the laws of nature shouldn't depend on where you were in the universe or how you were moving or anything like that, or where you were with, in relation to a gravitational body, the laws of nature should be the same for everybody. That is, reality doesn't depend on where you are. 
or how you're moving about. And from that notion, uh, basically, the special theory of relativity and the general relativity the uh, theory uh, follow. Now, it's a different lecture for me to tell you about the general theory of relativity. So we're not going to do that tonight. Sorry. Uh, but I will just say that I will toss out the standard line here. Gravity is curved space-time in the general relativistic picture. OK, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, what gravity does uh, is gravity is not so much just a force that's pulling on you, but it actually affects the way space and time operate. So that uh, how you move and how things move is, are determined by relationships between space and time, because the motion is a change of position in an amount of time. OK, so without going into too many details, what gravitational bodies do is change space and time in their vicinity. And the changes are very subtle, but they have profound impact on how you move. So we see this manifest as an attractive force to the mass of the Earth, but it's really a warping of the nature of space and time in the vicinity of the Earth. Okay, so just relax. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing changes. It, everything works the same way as you're used to. It's just a different way of thinking about it. All right, so when Einstein formulated his equations of relativity, his full general relativistic equation of relativity, he came up with an equation, which I will not show you, but basically on one side of the equation, it had mass and energy. So you figured out all the mass and energy that would be in some volume of space. The other side of the equation was the curvature of space-time. That is how space and time actually worked and how they related to one another. And the full set of equations was basically a complicated set of 10 different differential equations that were all interconnected and which uh, you couldn't just assume a, a coordinate system or you know, couldn't just assume space and time. They were part of the solution. So Einstein thought when he formulated his equations, he said, well, these are the equations that would govern gravity and it would govern how the universe works. But these equations are so complicated that the best you can do is sort of get approximate solutions to these equations. So he showed how in some approximations things matched up with various predictions you would make about the gravity of the Earth or the gravity of the Sun. He said, I don't think anybody is ever going to get a, an exact solution out of these equations. And shortly after he published his result, this gentleman, Carl Schwarzschild, uh, produced an exact solution to these equations. Now, Einstein actually was right. Uh, there are only a few exact solutions that anybody's ever been able to find because these are really incredibly complicated equations and the things they can do is just amazing. But Schwarzschild found an exact solution. And what he did was a, a very simple problem. He said, consider a mass, a spherical mass of mass m, so like a planet or a star. Uh, what is the gravitational field around that planet or star? And what he found was uh, an equation which described the gravitational field and describe the space-time configuration around that mass. Now, the thing was that if you looked at the properties of the space-time around that mass when you got down to the same radius, which was the dark star radius, this ridiculous you know, centimeter-sized Earth-mass size, um, he found some weird things happened. It looked like time came to a stop and space shrank to zero. Okay. <laughs> kind of weird. But for a long time, everybody said, well, let's just not worry about that because obviously this is a place where his solution, accurate though it is around most objects, breaks down. I mean, obviously space and time can't do that. So it, it must be a, just a failure of the solution in that limit because nothing could possibly be smooshed down to such an incredibly tiny size. Before you ever got there, you know, some force would stop the star from shrinking down. So it's, it's just a mathematical anomaly. Don't worry about it. Okay, and this was 1919, about uh, when they decided not to worry too much about this odd property. Now, relativity um, had its uh, big, big coming out party, as it were, in 1919 when uh, 
a number of expeditions were mounted to observe an eclipse of the sun which took place in that year. And the basic idea was this. Uh, relativity predicts that light will be bent by a gravitational field. Light will actually fall in a gravitational field. And so starlight passing close to the sun, uh, say if you had a star here and it's sending out its light, it would be bent by the sun by a small amount, which was 1.75 arc seconds, which is an incredibly tiny little bend. Uh, and so what would happen is the star is supposed to be here, but it would look on the skies if it was shifted over here. Okay, this is something today we refer to this as a gravitational lens, which is a gravitating body will actually bend light as it passes near it. Now, if you want to observe a star close to the sun, it's kind of hard to do because the sun's pretty bright. But if you do it during an eclipse, you can actually look at the stars close to the sun because the stars, sun's light is being blocked out by the moon covering the face of the sun. So they developed this eclipse expedition. A number of people went out to measure, and they found that the stars' positions did shift in accordance with Einstein's theory of relativity. And this is the point where the press you know, sort of picked up on this. You know. Expedition proves crazed German physicist Wright. Uh, you know, space and time strangely curved. Uh, no one understands what he means, but he's right. You know. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of when Einstein became a big household name because he came up with this wild new theory that seemed to be proven correct by observations. And so, you know, this is why uh, we remember Einstein today for coming up with a fundamental theory to describe the nature of the universe. Okay, so... At this point in history, what was not yet realized was that Schwarzschild, in solving Einstein's equations, had discovered something. He discovered a black hole. Okay? And the idea today, as we understand the black hole, is that it is a spherical body that has collapsed down below this size, this radius that was the dark star radius, and which is known today as the Schwarzschild radius after Carl Schwarzschild. So uh, once you've done that, actually what happens is that no light can escape from that point. Light is so strongly bent that it's bent and falls down inside the black hole. And so it is a, a, a collapsed star, which has basically collapsed forever. It's, it's falling down forever and takes all the light with it. Okay, And so as a theoretical prediction, it was a perfectly sound outcome of Einstein's general relativity, a prediction from the theory of an object so strange that nobody had sort of really given a serious notion that such a thing could exist. Okay, so a black hole then, you know, as we understand it today, generally we understand how they could form from, uh, from say, an explosion of a star, the core being collapsed down to a black hole, uh, leaving behind the event horizon, which is the point of no return surrounding a singularity at the very center of the black hole, which is where all the matter that was in the star is crushed to infinite density and zero volume. And that indeed, this indeed is a strange spot, which we still don't fully understand. Okay, now, let us entertain the notion that black holes exist, just for humor me on this, okay? Well, if black holes exist and they emit no light, how are we going to see them? Well, you look out and if you, don't, you see something that isn't there, it's a black hole. Found it. <laughs> Not good enough. What a black hole does leave behind is its gravitational field. Okay, it collapses down, but it leaves behind the gravity. The extremely strong gravity of the black hole is left behind. And it's things caught in that gravitational field that we can observe. So we observe the behavior of matter and light as they are affected by the strong gravitational field of the black hole. And that's how we can look for and detect black holes in the universe today. Okay, so this is sort of the theoretical background now to the notion of a black hole and a beginning to think a, a little bit about how we look for them in the universe. All right, so 
let's consider the range of black hole phenomena that we know about in the universe today. And, and I can only give you a few specific examples of black hole phenomena that will have to be representative for a whole zoo of black hole things that are out there. Okay. But these are some of the most interesting things in the universe. Now, um, first, just to sort of as a background, we tend to think about astronomy in terms of um, how we personally do it, which is with our eyeballs, or you look through a telescope. In other words, we're sensitive in our eyes to light that's in the so-called visible range of the spectrum, the full spectrum of light. It's an amazing coincidence, isn't it, that our eyes are sensitive to visible light. Okay. Another amazing coincidence is that our eyes are sensitive to visible light, and visible light makes it through the atmosphere. Okay. You know, the atmosphere is transparent to visible light, but it isn't transparent to all forms of light. And so isn't it lucky that we have eyes that can see in the type of light that makes it to the ground from the sun? Okay, so that's visible light. And we can observe it from the ground, or we can observe it from the uh, telescope. And we put the telescopes up on top of the mountain because, you know, if you get high enough, things get a lot drier. Uh, the air is stiller. It's not as full of, you know, well, I don't have to tell people who live in the Houston area <laughs> why you might want to get up higher above the, you know, to see better. Okay, so down at this end are radio waves from space. Radio waves make it all the way to the ground very nicely. So you can put your radio telescopes on the ground uh, anywhere you like around the world. But in other parts of the spectrum, uh, you really have to go to space. Uh, some infrared light, which is heat radiation, does make it down to high altitudes. It tends to be blocked to a large degree by water vapor in the air. But if you go to high enough mountains, you can still see much of the infrared pretty well. But uh, on further into the infrared, it really doesn't make it to in this, in past the uh, ground. So you put up s satellites like the Spitzer satellite, which is up operating now, viewing the universe in the infrared. Uh, ultraviolet doesn't make it through uh, the atmosphere, which is a good thing, by the way. Ultraviolet is what damages the skin. That's why you put on the skin lotion when you go out. And again, I don't have to tell people in Houston about this. Uh, but um, it's a kind of a annoyance to astronomers who would like to observe the universe in ultraviolet. So uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, it has an ultraviolet camera on it, and it has done a lot of uh, work in studying the ultraviolet part of the spectrum in the universe. Above that are X-rays and the higher energy gamma rays, which also have been studied from space. So uh, the point is that uh, because of our bias, our biological bias to observe the universe using our eyes, which is what we did before we devised uh, machinery to view the universe in other wavelengths, we tend to think of the universe in terms of the things we can see with our eyes, which, you know, stars are very good at producing light we can see. And this is a view of the whole sky, the Milky Way, uh, seen in different types of light. Over here is uh, visible light. And this is, again, the, the view of the sort of the whole sky unwrapped. And the Milky Way, which actually, for people who live in Houston, I do have to explain what the Milky Way is. It's a a band of faint light that goes across the sky, and it's actually our galaxy, as seen on, on the side. And you never see it around here. You have to go someplace dark to see it. And uh, that's getting harder to do these days with more and more light pollution. But be that as it may, it's up there, whether you see it or not. If you look in the radio, uh, you see an image like this uh, with, again, the Milky Way shows up very nicely. And that's from uh, radio emission given off by cold gas clouds that are throughout the Milky Way. In uh, infrared, we see a glow, again, associated with the Milky Way. This is from cold dust particles that are scattered throughout the Milky Way, which are giving off infrared heat radiation. Now, you know, heat in this context means the heat of uh, stuff that's maybe at 100 degrees above absolute zero, which we would not call heat. Uh, we would call that incredibly freaking cold. But uh, in astronomy, uh, the universe is basically a temperature of 2.7 to 2 degrees above absolute zero, so 100 degrees is, is pretty hot. Um, and here is gamma rays. Uh, gamma rays are, uh, again, associated strongly with the Milky Way. Uh, but this interesting image here is X-rays. And X-rays are associated with really hot gas, millions of degrees. And we see that, in fact, the hot gas that's producing the X-rays isn't really associated 
with the plane of the Milky Way, but it's associated with gas that's around the Milky Way. However, if you look here, if this was a better image and if you could see it, uh, that means I can get away with anything at this point. <laughs> there are little point sources scattered throughout the, the plane of the Milky Way associated with X-ray producing objects. Okay, so first let's consider radio. Here is a view of the very large radio telescope array, which is located in New Mexico. This was uh, commissioned in the 70s. Uh, it is, uh, was basically 27 uh, radio dishes, uh, which are working together to make one great radio telescope. Uh, you, if you've seen various movies, uh, Contact, I believe, is one. Uh, 2010, a sequel, Odyssey, was another one. Uh, where they actually went, and there's others, they, Hollywood loves this place, um, where they use this site. Uh, this telescope has the distinction, I think, of being uh, the uh, only major telescope facility that came in on time and under budget. So it's, it's legend. Um, anyway, what it could do, it was more sensitive than any radio telescope had ever been before. It had the capability of seeing more detail in radio images than it ever had been before. And it really revolutionized our understanding of certain phenomena associated with galaxies, which are something known as uh, jets, radio jets. And over here is an image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of the core of a radio galaxy called M87. Uh, and what one sees here in the purple is a, a high energy beam that's being emitted from the very core of the galaxy. Now, this particular beam had been known since the early part of the 20th century. It can be seen in the visible light. But uh, here we see fine, very fine detail with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is one of the most uh, powerful radio beams that we know of in the cosmos. It's the uh, galaxy located in the constellation of Cygnus. Here's what the galaxy looks like in visible light. It's sort of a nondescript, lumpy little thing. Uh, you wouldn't give it a second glance if you were looking at a bunch of galaxies. And it's actually located right down here. It's just a tiny, it's right there. Just a tiny little thing. Now, uh, the trouble, however, is that scale, you know, I say it's a tiny little thing, you know, does that mean the galaxy is this big? Uh, no. Uh, actually, this little drawing here is supposed to give you a scale model of the Milky Way galaxy. So you can take the Milky Way and stick it into one of these radio emitting lobes of high energy plasma and basically lose it in there. These things are enormous, and the amount of energy there is enormous. It's equal to more than, I couldn't think of any sort, the best I could come up in thinking of sort of scale of this is if you add 100 billion suns and you let them burn brightly for the entire age of the universe, you would just about get enough energy to inflate these radio loads. They have so much energy in them. That's a lot of energy. And what's even worse is that the energy is coming from the very core here. It's coming in a beam right down from the very core of this thing. So, I mean, you could imagine maybe getting 100 billion suns together and letting them burn brightly for uh, 10 billion years. That's a galaxy. But how do you get it to focus all of its energy into a beam? Here's a, another Hubble Space Telescope image. Here's a view which combines, this is the radio image. Here's a view of a galaxy in optical. So you've got this radio jet coming out and this galaxy here it doesn't look like too much. But the Hubble Space Telescope could zoom in, and it sees this uh, right down in the core, a flattened disk of gas and a bright spot, and this fan here, which is aligned perfectly with the jet. So the Hubble te Telescope tells us that all of this energy from this jet is coming out from some tiny region in the center of this galaxy. Okay, And this type of galaxy is not common but it's not rare either. There's lots of these so-called active galaxies out there producing these radio jets by some powerful central engine, the monster at the center of the galaxy. Okay. Now, it was realized fairly early on that there aren't a lot of ways to get that much energy in such, out of such a small region. And so in the 60s, uh, people were basically saying, I can't, you know, basically, I can't think of any way to do this except possibly through gravitational power, 
through gravity power, through gravitational collapse, through formation of a large black hole system. Okay. So, here's an animation which kind of shows the idea. We're zooming back now uh, from the core of a galaxy. Uh, you know, so we leave behind a little tiny core, the system in the galaxy, there's the galaxy, and here is the idea of how the radio jets eject out from the core of the galaxy and clear out this volume of space around here. Okay, so that's again, that's a computer animation of the idea, is that some central powerhouse deep in the galaxy is able to generate this energy and shoot it out in these beams in opposite directions. So all you have to do is explain that. <laughs> okay, now, Back to those little x-ray dots I mentioned earlier. Uh, when the idea of x-ray astronomy first came up, uh, the, uh, basically people said x-ray astronomy is ridiculous. Uh, nothing is going to be producing much x-rays. Because to have x-rays, you have to have gas that's at millions of degrees uh, hot. And the sun is only 6,000 degrees. And it produces most of its light in the visible. There's a few x-rays that come from the hot atmosphere of the sun, but it's just not that significant. So if you want to build an x-ray satellite and go looking for x-rays, you'll see something from the sun. But other than that, there's just not going to be much up there. Well, fortunately, a few pioneering people didn't listen to that sort of advice. And they first launched uh, x-ray uh, detectors on balloons. And they found evidence for x-rays. And uh, in the 1970, NASA launched uh, the first uh, highly capable X-ray satellite, which was called Uhura. Uh, and amongst the various things it discovered, it discovered quite a few things, but one thing that it discovered was an object in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan, which was a bright X-ray source, which became known as Cygnus X1, which means constellation Cygnus X-ray source number one. Okay, so. Sometimes astronomers can be prosaic when they give names to things. Cygnus X1, it was quickly realized, was a binary star system, okay, which is a, a binary star system is a system with two stars in it, okay? And in this particular case, one of the stars was an ordinary blue supergiant star, very massive, very bright, but the other object was something that wasn't producing any light, particularly, it was producing X-rays, and it seemed to be more massive than this very massive blue star. That's very strange. Here's a uh, sort of an animation of what a binary system like this might look like. You can see the stars are orbiting around each other. One of them is an ordinary bright blue star here, and the other is some sort of compact little star down there. But it must be very massive to balance out that huge blue star. And you can see gas being drawn by gravity from this star going into orbit around the little compact star here. Now we know now that there's lots of these so-called uh, interacting binary star systems out there. And a lot of them, this star here is a white dwarf star, which is a odd beast, but not as odd as a black hole. In uh, a white dwarf star, uh, basically it's still producing light. It's white, white light. It's very small. It, for the sun, it would be about the size of the Earth. Take the sun and squish it down to the Earth size, and you've got a white dwarf. A neutron star is another compact object, uh, even stranger than the white dwarf. Uh, that's what you get when you take the sun and squish it down to about 10 kilometer size. Okay, And that's a uh, star that's been so compacted that all the nuclei and the atoms are pressed up against each other into a great single ball of nuclear neutron matter. Again, kind of an odd beast. but some of these objects have more mass in them than could be account possibly held up by the strength of the neutrons in the neutron star. These are the objects we think are black holes. Now, skipping quickly over the next 40 years, um, we've had a series of uh, NASA and other countries have launched a series of X-ray detecting satellites. Here's a just a few of them. One was the Einstein satellite was a major one in 1978. It was the first X-ray imaging satellite. It made an incredible number of discoveries. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is the uh, Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, uh, which went up and had a very, uh, it was able to do rapid observations of X-ray systems and discover basically how the systems change in time over very rapid time scales. Uh, and finally, the Chandra X-ray satellite, which was launched in 1999, 
and uh, is producing discovery after discovery, uh, which, you know, you sort of press release after press release coming down from uh, data collected from the Chandra satellite. And so uh, these X-ray satellites have been basically giving us a lot of data about the nature of these compact X-ray binaries and, by implication, information about black holes. Uh, the last example here is, uh, is the, uh, the monster of the Milky Way. I said that uh, the way you can detect a black hole is by the effect it has gravitationally on other objects. And we saw a couple of examples. One uh, of how it's, it manages to heat gas up and produce jets. Another example is uh, the X-ray systems, X-ray binary systems, heat gas up, produce X-rays. Here we have an example of the black hole exercising its gravitational force simply on changing the orbits of stars. And as you know, telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes uh, have improved in their power, people have been able to look into the cores of nearby galaxies and see how stars are orbiting around. And they can detect the presence of something very, very massive down in the cores of these galaxies in a very compact region. Okay. So the idea is that uh, galaxies probably have in their centers black holes whose masses are millions or billions times as massive as the sun. Now, even a black hole that massive, you know, a black hole, say, that was as massive as a billion times the mass of the sun, its size would be about the same as the orbit of the Earth. It's not big at all. So you could easily drop one down in the center of a galaxy. And without taking up much room, that's the point. But its gravity would be enormous, and it would affect the orbits of stars. Now, in the case of our own Milky Way, the thing is that when you look towards the center of the Milky Way, uh, and that's inside this circle here, what you see is sort of darkness. You know, lots of stars here, uh, but this looks like there aren't any stars at all. This is something that confused uh, early astronomers for many years, and it wasn't realized till the 20th century what was going on here is that it's not that there aren't any stars there, but that there's a lot of dust blocking our view. Okay, it's like looking through a fog. We can't see the invisible light. We can't see into the center of the Milky Way. Okay, but these dust particles, we can see through them if you look in certain wavelengths of the infrared. Okay, the Keck telescope seen here Keck 1 and Keck 2. Uh, and here's a view of the mirror of the Keck telescope with a little person there looking through the hole in the center. Uh, the Keck telescopes were built uh, quite a while ago now, actually, sort of getting out to the order of 20 years. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, but they were phenomenal at their time. Uh, you can see how big this mirror is. And the mirror is not one solid piece of glass or anything. It's made up of hexagons. So the mirror, instead of being a big unified piece of glass, is uh, segmented. It's made up of hexagons that are put together like this into about 10 meters across. Okay, and so it works so well, they built a second one uh, up here. And this is the top of uh, Mauna Kea, the extinct volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, and Mauna Kea is one of the premier uh, astronomical sites in the world because it's up at 14,000 feet. And it's extremely dry there, as I think you can sort of see. Uh, basically, if you go up to Mauna Kea, the, all the clouds of Hawaii, everybody knows it rains in Hawaii all the time, but they're all down well below. So it's very dry on top. You're up at 14,000 feet. You're out in the middle of the ocean, so the air is very smooth. It's just a wonderful place for observing. And that's why there's all these telescopes up here on top of the mountain. Now, even with such a great site as the top of a volcano in Hawaii, you still have the problem in astronomy of the fact that we are, we've got all this troublesome air. Okay? If you ask astronomers, well, you know, first, let's get rid of all the lights. That'll make observing better. And next, let's get rid of the air, because the air is shimmering constantly. and makes the stars twinkle. The stars aren't really twinkling. That's it's not an intrinsic thing stars do. What's happening is the light's coming down through turbulent air, and it smears out the image. OK? So the best you can do, then, if you're just looking through a telescope, is whatever the smeared image due to the turbulence of the air. But clever people figured out that they've got this segmented mirror, 
and they could put uh, little itty bitty servos, little thrusters, and change the shape of the mirror in real time to change the focus. Uh, now, what are you going to do with that? Well, you don't have an operator sitting there twiddling knobs trying to get the thing into focus or anything. That's, that's not going to work. What you do is uh, you have a computer. Computers always can do things a lot faster than humans that looks at the sky image and as the image shifts around because of the turbulence in the air, it actually shifts the mirror to get rid of the turbulence. This is something called adaptive optics. And it was actually sort of, uh, sort of uh, something that uh, has, it's actually now gotten down to commercial. Uh, you can go out and buy yourself a pair of binoculars uh, that uh, you put a couple of batteries in, you punch the button, and it'll steady the, the uh, image for you by wiggling the mirror to compensate as you're sitting there j jittering because you've had too many cups of coffee before you go out. Anyway, here's an animation. This is the sort of what you see if you just look through the telescope without the adaptive optics. And then this animation shows when they turn on the adaptive optics how the image gets sharp. And in particular, this is right down to the center of the Milky Way in infrared. And what one sees is that a blob of light, which you know you can't make anything out of this, but as they turn on the adaptive optics, what emerges are individual stars right down in the center of the Milky Way. And so using this great big telescope at this premier site, using this advanced adaptive optics technique, we actually were able to image stars right at the very heart of our galaxy, which is quite amazing. But that's not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is that they've watched these stars now since 1993, and they've found that they can actually watch the stars moving. Okay, Most people realize, you know, if you think back to the Big Dipper that you saw, if you're old enough, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, it's the same Big Dipper as you see tonight. The stars don't move that much. We never notice it. But we can actually, with the telescope, see stars moving at the core of the Milky Way. And here it traces out, this is just a computer animation of the star's positions where they put out these little lines to indicate how the stars are moving. And what one sees is you're getting orbits. The stars are orbiting. Okay. Now, orbiting stars. Well, what are they orbiting? Good question. Here, watch this guy come in here. Zoop. He goes around the corner. There's something there that the star is orbiting around. And this star is orbiting around it, too. And this star is orbiting around it. All the stars are orbiting around this spot, which doesn't have anything lit up. Something dark there, but has enormous gravity. Now, one thing we can do, do very well, is calculate orbits. If we couldn't do that, NASA couldn't have sent the Voyager spacecraft out to, say, Neptune, and have it fly by Neptune at, you know, to be precisely positioned at Neptune after uh, umpty ump years of travel to within a foot or whatever it is, you know, we know how to do orbits. We can predict orbits very well. So we can take this data and calculate what these guys must be orbiting around. And you come up with a number which is about three million times the mass of the sun. Some dark object down there has about three million times the mass of the sun. And it's located in a very tiny region. Now, it's not, we can't say that it's located in a region as small as uh, what the black hole's size would actually be, but getting right down there. And there isn't much, you know, there isn't anything else, right? There's nothing sort of kind of like a black hole, but not quite a black hole. It's like really big, but, you know, not really a black hole yet. No, there just isn't anything. We don't have anything that could fill in that, that slot. So we seem to be looking right down into the core of the galaxy and seeing evidence for this monstrous black hole in our galaxy. Fortunately, it's not up to anything at the moment. It seems quiet for the most part. It's probably because it's not being fed. Okay. The trouble with black holes comes from the fact that when you feed them, they're very messy eaters. Okay, so I've given you a couple of examples then of black holes and how they how are certain things that happen in the universe? There are other examples, but uh, what we've seen are these active galaxies producing these enormous jets of radiation. We've seen the X-ray binary systems, which are producing 
uh, these hot X-rays uh, emitting from a very dense, tight binary system. And we've seen uh, in our own Milky Way galaxy the presence of some monster lurking down there with three million solar masses. Okay. So I'd like to turn then to uh, just a little bit about the sort of work I do related to black holes, but which is trying to get an improved theory of how matter moves in the vicinity of black holes and how that leads to these phenomena we're, we're talking about. Okay, so just to summarize first, where are the black holes in the universe? Okay, first uh, there are these supermassive black holes which uh, are millions to billions times as massive as the sun and are located down in the centers of galaxies. Now some of them are active, producing jets and other emission, and some are quiet, like the one in our Milky Way. Uh, the one in our Milky Way does produce some X-rays. You can detect it with the Chandra X-ray satellite, for example, but it's not, it's not enormous amounts of X-rays, but it, it does show up. Uh, the active guys uh, will, can produce these great big jets, so they're sort of the dramatic examples. Uh, quasars are another example of this, radio galaxies, various high-energy phenomenon associated with galaxies. Uh, these stellar mass black holes are about 10 to 100 times as massive as the sun. Uh, if they're in a binary system and they're being fed by eating gas off their companion star, then you can, they can produce hot gas, which is millions of degrees, and produce x-rays. But there should also be a lot of black holes wandering around through the universe that aren't in binary systems. Uh, and uh, uh, there's ways you can detect some of those guys. Uh, we hope that there aren't any too close by, and if they are close by, that they don't come for a visit. Uh, I think we're, we're pretty safe there, actually. I'm not too worried about that. Um, these sorts of black holes could have very well be formed in certain types of supernova explosions. When the star blows up, the core collapses down to a black hole. They may also be associated with a phenomenon known as gamma ray bursts, which are uh, detected again by uh, a series of gamma ray satellites. These are sudden bursts of gamma rays that come to us from across the universe. They're so incredibly energetic. We think that a lot of these things are associated with a super, huge supernova called the hypernova, which actually creates a black hole in its core, which then sucks in a lot of the, uh, the remaining bit of the star in a very messy, energetic activity. Uh, gamma ray bursts are really quite amazing, and this is another case where it's a good thing that there aren't any gamma ray bursts nearby. Um, I would note also, just uh, for completeness, that the Chandra X-ray satellite has detected uh, possibly a new class of black hole, the so-called intermediate black mass black hole, which might have a, about a thousand or so times the mass of the the uh, sun. But this remains a little uncertain at this at this time. So uh, it's it's a place where there may be further developments. But it, it's I thought it worth mentioning because it was a a result from the Chandra X-ray satellite. Okay, so uh, accretion then is the basic power mechanism for black hole systems. Where does the energy come from? Well, the energy comes from something very familiar, falling down in a gravitational field. If I drop an object here, and the only objects I have cost money, so I probably shouldn't drop it. Um, if I drop something, it falls down, it picks up speed, it hits and splats and maybe bursts apart at the release of that energy, but falling things produce energy. Water wheels, water falling, dams, water falling down through the dam, releases energy. So in the case of a black hole, you have an immense gravitational field. So if you let matter fall down towards the black hole, basically you can get a lot of energy out of that. What happens? Gas, say, drawn from a star here it goes into orbit, and the orbital speeds are very fast, and they become even faster and faster as you get down close to the black hole. Orbits around objects, you have to go faster to stay in orbit the closer you are to the object. Okay, so down here close to the black hole, the gas is moving around to close to the fraction of the speed of light, a good fraction of the speed of light. And if you take a lot of mass and you move it at the speed of light and then you start smashing it into other bits of gas, you're going to get a lot of heating. Okay, so the notion is that energy is released through a process which is in a system called an accretion disk, which is a disk where matter is accreting or falling down into the black hole and that there's turbulence in this disk, which heats the gas up to high temperatures associated with orbital speeds that are close to the speed of light. So the temperatures can get up so high 
that it's easy for them to produce x-rays which then are emitted in the x-ray system. Now, just to say the, uh, the small little bit of this that uh, I you know, personally had a hand in was the realization that uh, magnetic fields are crucial to this process. And here's the idea. Think about the, the rings of Saturn, for example. They got particles that are in orbit. And they just orbit around Saturn you know, for eons. So little bits of icy particles are in orbit around Saturn forming the rings. And they just orbit. They don't become turbulent and produce x-rays or anything. They, they just orbit. So orbits are generally stable. Objects orbiting around the uh, Earth here now uh, are in stable orbits. So the question is, what makes uh, an orbit, a gas in orbit, why should it spiral in? Why shouldn't it just orbit around and around and around smoothly? Okay, what we discovered, uh, colleague Steve Balbus uh, and I back in 90, 90, 90, 91, which now seems a remarkable long time ago, um, realized that uh, magnetic fields made all the difference in changing a stable orbit around an object into an unstable orbit. And uh, just for, I, I can't resist again, since this was my, my uh, bailiwick, just sort of explaining it. Um, and to do it, I'll explain how it does it through an analogy, which is suppose we have a, a couple of rather expensive pieces of hardware in orbit around the Earth, and we would like those two objects to come together. Okay. Uh, this, this uh, picture I made, actually, I, I really should have put the Hubble Space Telescope up in the higher orbit and the shuttle in the lower orbit, but uh, since I don't think, I, if, you, if you get into this configuration, you've kind of made a mistake, actually, I <laughs> think. Um, but uh, the thing about orbits, again, is that you have to move fast to stay in orbit. Okay, you have to go fast enough so that when you fall down, the Earth curves away. The closer you are to the Earth, the faster you have to go. So in this configuration, uh, the Hubble will go faster. That's why it has a longer arrow than compared to the shuttle, which is up higher in this picture. So if you just let these guys orbit in their normal orbits, the Hubble will move away okay, and separate from the shuttle because it's just moving faster. Okay, so, um, well, what to do then? Well, if you're in this configuration, you say, okay, I've got to catch up with this, this puppy. I've got to catch up with this, this Hubble space telescope. I'll just turn on my engines and speed up. Well, what happens if you do that is that you actually go to a higher orbit. Okay, so if you add, you know, if you thrust yourself forward, you don't speed up, you go to a higher orbit. And if you go to a higher orbit, you actually orbit at a slower rate. So by firing your engines this way, you go forwards, you go up, and you drop further back. So paradoxically, in orbit, you have to sort of turn it around and brake a little, which makes you drop down to a lower orbit. And of course, if the shuttle wants to come back to Earth, uh, you know, what it does is break so that it'll drop down. Okay. So to rendezvous in this configuration, you have to fire your rockets in the opposite direction, drop to a lower orbit. In fact, you drop to an even lower orbit so you can catch up. And then there you are. All right. So what if a clever person suggested an alternative? Well, I don't like all this rocket stuff. Let's just stick down a spring. Let the spring pull the objects together. Then I don't have to fire the rockets. You save fuel. You get a nice, smooth, safe rendezvous. Nice springy spring there. So let's just lower it down and hook onto the latch, which they conveniently placed on the back end of the Hubble. All right. Now, in fact, this doesn't work. As shocking as that may be. <laughs> the reason it doesn't work, what does a spring do? Well, it, it's trying to pull, right? And what it does is pull on the shuttle, pulling it this way, and it grabs the Hubble and pulls it back this way. So what does that mean? Well, it means it breaks the Hubble. I mean, break as in break, not break. Uh, which causes it to slow down, drop to a lower orbit, pulls this guy forward, making him go to a higher orbit. And what happens when you go to a lower orbit? You go faster. Higher orbit, you go slower. So paradoxically, the pulling action of the spring causes the two satellites to get further and further apart. What it's doing for the technical audience uh, is it's transferring angular momentum from the Hubble telescope to the shuttle, causing it to run away. It's, that's the nature of the instability. Now, 
What actually happens with a magnetic field and an accretion disk is that the magnetic field is capable of acting like a spring, connecting a fluid, bit of fluid here with a bit of fluid here, transferring angular momentum and causing the fluid to separate. And that's an unstable process. Okay. So it doesn't work. It's not very good for uh, shuttles and Hubble Space Telescopes, but it's great in an accretion disk for getting stuff to spiral in. Okay. Now, even uh, once you figure that out, um, you're still left with sort of a set of equations here. Uh, please, I'll give you a moment to write these down. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you can turn in, you should turn in these, uh, solve these equations and turn them into David by, uh, by Monday, I think. Um, what happened, you know, okay. These are not simple equations to solve, but uh, what you can do is uh, you can put them into a computer, which is what I do. Okay. So here's, a, uh, here's an example, just a little animation of a, uh, a uh, disk of gas as it's calculated orbiting around a black hole. See, you can see it. You cannot see it right down here. The gas is orbiting around. This is a, from a supercomputer simulation. Here's a picture of a supercomputer. Um, this one is the uh, Ranger supercomputer, which is located at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is in Austin, Texas. And this is one of the uh, biggest computers available for scientific research in the open market, as it were, uh, available for scientists. It's part of the uh, National Science Foundation's TerraGrid computational facility. Uh, and so I, I don't know for sure that I have any black hole simulations running there tonight, but uh, I, you know, there's lots of black hole simulations that have run there. Okay. So by using computer simulations, we can actually figure out, or begin to figure out, I wouldn't say we've completely figured it out, but we can figure out what gas does when it's magnetized and in the vicinity of a black hole and calculate how it spirals down, how energy is released, and in principle, how jets form, and uh, how the gas is heated and produces the x-rays. Okay. To summarize then, um, this is a, a summary slide, and then I'm going to end by showing you a, an animation uh, which combines uh, a computer simulation of a, a accretion system that I did with a calculation of how light would actually move in a black hole system. Okay, so that's just to keep you paying attention through the summary slide. Uh, so th there's something good coming after this, right? This this is the part that will be on the test, though. So so pay attention here. Um, so in summary, far from being invisible, black holes in the universe produce amazing energetic activity, phenomena of the highest energy. And in, if you add up all of the light that they produce throughout uh, the history of the universe, it may amount to as much as 10% of all the light that's produced in the universe due to ordinary stars. So far from insignificant, black holes are a major component of the energy in the universe. Uh, space and ground-based observations now are revealing more and more about these systems. Uh, in particular, the advanced satellites that are launched into space have, have provided a wealth of data about black holes in the last couple of decades, uh, and we anticipate that that should continue. At the same time now, the availability of ever more advanced computers uh, is allowing us to begin to model these fairly complex systems at the sort of the level of detail we need to really understand what's going on. Okay, and like I said now, um, we'll end with a, a bit of an animation. Uh, here. There we go. Now, what this is, just to, to set it up, uh, here is a black hole. Here is a, uh, an image that's just put into the background. So the, this, this movie is produced in a computer and it's, so it's imagining a black hole inside the Milky Way. So this view in the back is the Milky Way, and in fact, it goes on around behind you. Uh, and the camera will be moving around uh, through the animation. And I'll just begin to point out right here, the first thing you see is uh, here's the band of the Milky Way, and then when you get to the black hole, you actually get this weird distortion, and that's because of all the light that's being bent very sharply by the black hole. So as the movie goes forward, watch for stars and galaxies to pass behind the black hole and have their light distorted by the gravitational field of the black hole. 
The other thing that will happen in this movie is you'll see an accretion disk form and a jet form. And that's from the supercomputer simulation that I did where I simply started with some gas and magnetized gas around the black hole and just let it evolve and it's visualized here in this simulation. So without further ado, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I just gave you a thousand words to describe the picture. <laughs> so let's go ahead and watch the animation. All right. So watch this little galaxy come in. And it's, see the, how its light is distorted by the black hole. Okay, so now the jet has formed here. Like I said, the, the camera view moves about uh, as we approach and recede from the black hole to give different perspectives. You can see also the, uh, these rings here are called Einstein rings. And it's the, a point source directly behind the black hole has its light bent around the black hole to form a ring of light around the black hole. So an Einstein ring is a phenomenon associated with a strong gravitational field. So you see a lot of distortions in the light from the accretion disk owing to that. And it's something in principle you could look for in future observations of enough sensitivity. You could look for the gravitational effects on the light produced by an accretion disk. There's a view from the above passing over the pole. And then moving on around to the other side, you can again see the jet fairly nicely and the gas swirling around in the disk. Zooming in towards the black hole. Best not to go inside. <laughs> uh, in a computer, you could go inside and actually come back out, but that's the only way you could do that. So, Whew, lucky, we just pulled back in time. <laughs> Amazing, amazing thing. I should give credit for the, this movie it was produced by uh, uh, Professor Andrew Hamilton at the uh, University of Colorado uh, using a system he's developed over a number of years to visualize what happens near black holes. And so he was able to take data that I produced from the supercomputer simulation to generate that movie. Okay, so thank you very much. All right, that was a fascinating talk, wasn't it? Um, this talk is going to be available hopefully sometime within the next few weeks on our website via streaming video. So. Anybody who um, would like to see it again or would like to share this with family or friends, um, just keep stopping by our website to check this out. And also, uh, for anybody who would like to know more about black holes or general relativity or plasmas or uh, orbital dynamics, we teach courses in all those things. <laughs> and um, in fact, I have a course that meets on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. on general relativity. So I, I know you guys will be in line for that. We're in late <laughs> registration right now. Um, with that, uh, we have two microphones in the front. Uh, there's one on this side and one on that side near the exits. And so if you have any questions for Dr. Holly, uh, please come down. You don't have to. I, you know, it's okay. Uh, we don't have to have questions, uh, but you're certainly welcome to ask them. Uh, yeah, if you're located in the center and you have an urgent question and it would be like a real total pain to get to a microphone, you can ask me and I'll repeat your question so everyone can hear. Okay, so the question is about the visualization, uh, that it's uh, really nifty and it helps, helps people understand what's going on, but what do they do for me? Uh, that, well, there's different types of visualizations, but it's almost impossible, even for me, well, even for me, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's almost incredibly difficult to figure out uh, what's going on in one of these simulations just by looking at single snapshots. Uh, it, it really does help me to understand the dynamics to be able to look at, at animated frames. I won't necessarily go to all the trouble to uh, produce something as nifty as that. Uh, it might be a short animation of a particular property, but uh, uh, the analogy I used to use is that uh, 
it's like watching a cartoon and just trying to figure out what the plot is by looking at a couple of frames out of the cartoon. So it really does, it does help to, to, even for the person doing the simulation to see an animation. Yes. What do you think the odds are of us creating a miniature version of a <laughs> Oh, a loaded question. <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't advise it. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, Arthur C. Clarke wrote a book a long time ago uh, whose name I don't remember now. <laughs> Where, thank you. <laughs> um, where? 1973. He imagined, yeah. It's, it's so good to have experts in the audience. Uh, where he imagined uh, creating microscopic black holes that you could then fire matter at. And, and basically, a black hole can, nuclear reactions can give you less than 1% mc squared. And everybody knows mc squared is an enormous amount of energy, as understood by Einstein's general relativity. Black hole power could give you anything up to uh, 10 to 40 percent mc squared. So uh, it's an enormous amount of energy, uh, but we probably shouldn't plan on using it for terrestrial applications. And frankly, just in case anybody's wondering, the Large Hadron Collider cannot make deadly black holes. It's just, it's, it's not, not that good. Uh, it, it can't do anything that nature isn't doing to us right now. Um, I mean, it's so, just relax, chill on that one, okay? If there were a millimeter-sized black hole where we haven't looked, inside the Earth, how could we tell? Uh, well, if you had a millimeter-sized black hole inside the Earth, uh, it would, uh, is, is it stationary or is it moving? In the middle. In, okay, it's stationary in the middle. Uh, it would very slowly add matter to itself, releasing energy. So you probably wouldn't notice it for a very, very long time. Uh, because the rate at which a tiny black hole like that would be able to add matter to it would be rather low. But eventually, it in principle, could add a lot of matter to it and eventually add uh, even more matter to it and eventually add all of the available matter to it. Uh, so, uh, the notion of really tiny black holes is uh, sort of an interesting one. It, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, in fact, investigated the nature of black holes uh, a long time ago. And one of the realizations was that uh, if you could make tiny black holes through extremely energetic events, uh, but those black holes actually would evaporate. They would, they would sort of return to energy. Uh, through a quantum mechanical process. And so it was conceived that maybe in the, the Big Bang itself, which is the only possible uh, event where tiny, tiny black holes might have been created, that perhaps the Big Bang itself would have produced lots of little tiny black holes who might then subsequently have annihilated and producing some sort of signature that we could detect uh, you know, in the universe today. But there, there hasn't been any evidence for that. So it's a, an interesting idea, but no evidence in support of it has ever been found. Could you say something about, what, more about uh, the mechanism for the jets around the black holes? Okay. Um, the mechanism for the jets that you see in my simulations is actually a magnetic one. Okay. Magnetic fields are drawn down to the black hole, and they're actually get attached to the black hole. They're anchored into the, basically, the plasma around the black hole. And because the black hole is spinning, it has a rotating space-time around it, which is actually twisting the magnetic field, putting a differential twist along the magnetic field, which is driving a flux of magnetic energy outwards. And so because it's being powered by an incredibly massive rotating black hole, the electromagnetic energy flux coming out from that is very large. Okay, and so that's one mechanism by which a, a jet might be produced. It's not the only possible mechanism, but it's the mechanism that I was able to simulate in these simulations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. My question is, uh, 
Is it possible if Tachyons exist? I'm curious how you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, first question, first question is what is a tachyon? Uh, all ordinary matter particles must go at a velocity less than the speed of light. So uh, the notion then is that, uh, you know, if the escape speed from a black hole is greater than the speed of light, ordinary matter particles can't get out. Tachyons are hypothetical notions. Uh, who would be particles that could only go faster than the speed of light. That is, they couldn't go less than the speed of light. Okay, so if tachyons existed and they were inside a black hole, then in principle they would have world lines or trajectories through space-time that would allow them to come out. But you may have noticed a lot of if, 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 if there. Uh, so I don't know how many ifs it takes before, you know, it gets to be, uh, but I wouldn't worry about it. I would like to know that how much is the uh, how would you uh, how much ex uh, you expect the magnetic field strength which you use in your simulation and what is the source of magnetic field and okay. there is another a little related question that is there any observational evidence for the existence of accretion disk I'm not talking about black hole only even for binary systems binary yep. stars uh, yes uh, let's do the second one first yes. is, is there any direct evidence for the accretion existence of accretion disk uh, and the answer to that is the best evidence, direct evidence for the existence of accretion disks comes from certain systems called eclipsing binary systems, okay. where you can actually see the light of the disk as it emerges from behind the star, as this, you know, this, the plane of the orbit is in our, our view plane, so we can actually, the star blocks the disk and then reveals it, and so you can actually watch the disk as it emerges from behind the star, and by using, you know, careful measurements you can actually see how big the disk is. The other question was what the strength of the magnetic field was. Uh, I don't know if you wanted in Gauss or Teslas or something. Whatever the universe. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the best, best way to say is that uh, the, uh, the, the measure of the strength of the magnetic field it would be in terms of the average gas pressure uh, or the gas energy around the disk in the disk. And the, in the disk itself, the magnetic field is weaker than the, it is less energetic than the gas. The thermal energy of the gas is much greater than the magnetic energy, but outside of the the gas, the the outside of the disk, the magnetic energy is comparable sort of to the thermal energy of the system. Which so those are not incredibly strong magnetic fields, but they're not totally weak either. And that's sort of the that's sort of what's necessary for this uh, magnetic instability to operate. Is that has to be sort of on order the energy associated with the the pressure in the gas. So it's, it's strong, but it's not incredibly strong. And then the, where the field comes from, uh, is this. most ma stars have magnetic fields, and so they easily could bring matter or magnetic field in. The anecdote I would tell in this, this you know, I can't resist telling this slight little anecdote question about you know, where does the magnetic field come from? Before my colleague Steve Balbus and I discovered a use for the magnetic fields in the accretion disk, Everybody assumed that accretion disks would have magnetic fields in them, but that they wouldn't be very important. When we discovered they were very important, people said, ah, but you can't assume that there are magnetic fields present. <laughs> <laughs> we found a use for them, right? So then the question became an open one. Okay. Yes, good question. Uh, one of the problems with being an astronomer <laughs> is that you can look, but you can't touch. Uh, and uh, so it's difficult to validate in the sense we would often do with numerical simulations, which is actually to go to the laboratory and do a, uh, a uh, actual experiment. Uh, in the case of this, uh, the validation comes from observations which are increasingly detailed of properties of accretion systems which we try to explain with these simulations, which is ongoing effort. 
And another thing, one area where we do have possibility of experimental tests is this magnetic instability. Uh, it's something that you actually can observe in the laboratory in certain laboratory regimes that are achievable. Uh, and there's a number of experiments around the world which are trying to observe that property in the lab. Uh, but it's difficult because you have to work to do magnetic experiments on, in the lab on Earth, you either have to have a, a big vat of liquid gallium, which is a you know, liquid metal, which is very expensive, or a big vat of liquid sodium, which you have to heat up to a very high temperature and kind of dangerous. Anyway, uh, or you have to have a plasma in a big vacuum bottle, which is, again, sort of difficult and expensive. So they aren't easy experiments to do, but people are trying to do them to validate. Nobody. <laughs> I don't think anybody, the, the, the math is simple enough that everybody believes, I think, the, the instability, but it would be nice to see it in the laboratory. I think it, eventually it will be possible. There is the idea that uh, information that falls into a black hole will never be lost. Uh, be there lost is that idea, yes. Can you explain what that means? Because I can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, uh, yeah, the. Uh, uh, only really, really casually. Uh, the, uh, in the classic black hole, you can throw anything into it. And the only thing that's remembered by the gravitational field around it is what was the mass energy that you put in, whether there was any angular momentum and whether there was any electric charge. And so, the, but matter and, and nature, there's a lot more information in stuff than, than those things. There's other quantum numbers, for example, that, than those things. So. The question is, uh, is that really what happens? And if so, why does all this quantum information about stuff in the universe just simply cease to exist if it goes into a black hole? So this is an area of active research that you know, Stephen Hawking has been very active in working on this for a number of years, uh, is, is what really happens at sort of in the quantum mechanical level. And the reason we don't know is because we don't have a theory that combines quantum mechanics with general relativity yet. But this is a forefront area. <laughs> Uh, of research, you know. So that's a that's as good as I can do, I think. When you say black hole sucks in mass? <laughs> oh, I don't think I said black hole suck, did I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, you could have a black hole sitting there uh, quietly producing its gravity and nothing fall into it, okay? So the, the gravity of a black hole uh, isn't any different from any other gravity except that it's more intense close to the black hole. So if I had a black hole sitting here and just empty space around it and say you were in a spaceship, you'd be coming along and you'd feel the gravity of this black hole, but it wouldn't be any different than if it was an ordinary star here. Uh, it would just be that your, your trajectory might be a, a, you know, bent a little bit as you are pulled in a little by, the, by a star or a planet or anything else. Uh, the only time you know, the, the, the black holes begin to you know, draw stuff in is if you start feeding them stuff. So if you put it next to a star, it'll start uh, drawing gas off that star and sucking it in. So black holes will only do that if you feed them. Okay, so you have to feed the black hole before it eats. And when the black hole eats, it's a really messy eater. So I don't know, I don't know, it's throwing stuff out and making a real mess. But if you stop feeding it, it just sits there. So there could be lots of black holes out there just sitting around, not doing anything particularly. My name is Alex Monchak. I'm in the engineering management program over here at the University of Houston Clear Lake. I'm a student. Uh, in the visual, it showed that the black hole is spinning, and the accretion dish is also spinning in, uh, is it valid that you cannot assume that they're both spinning in the same direction? Uh, it, yeah, you, it need not be the case that they should both spin in the same direction. Uh, and, uh, if the, uh, the question would be where first, why is the black hole spinning the way it is spinning, which it might be just the spin of the star that it, when it went supernova, it already had some spin, and it just keeps that. And then the, um, if gas falls in, it might very well fall in with an opposite sense of spin. But if the black hole has been getting gas in the same sense of spin for a long, long time, it might be that the gas itself has spun it up. 
in which case it would be spinning in the same direction. If it spins in the opposite direction, it does other interesting things. Uh, and we did do a few simulations like that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, dark gravity, but do you have any favorite uh, dark matter candidates that Yeah. Out there? Uh, yeah, I guess I have favorites. Uh, the the issue is about dark matter. Uh, dark matter uh, is the matter that's out there. It's something out there that's producing gravity. It's not producing any light. And the amount of gravity it produces in the universe is much, much greater than the gravity that's being produced by the visible stars. So it's part of this embarrassing problem that cosmologists have, which is that uh, most of the universe is made up of something we don't know what it is. Okay. So the question is, what is the dark matter? And the question is, do I have an opinion on what is the dark matter? And I would point out that my opinion on this is not worth a whole lot. But uh, if you want to know my opinion, uh, it would seem, again, uh, I would find very convincing some recent, op recent observations by the Chandra X-ray satellite, uh, X -ray satellite uh, which showed that the uh, comparing with uh, observations that make use of the gravitational lensing effect of a cluster of galaxies, which show that the matter, the, sort of the, where the matter is located versus where all the gravity-producing stuff is located are separate which suggests to me, at least, that, that whatever it is that's the dark matter is, in fact, not made up of some sort of ordinary matter. It's not associated with the ordinary matter, which would be some sort of unusual, or it's actually not unusual. It's only unusual because we don't know about it. Some extremely common but unknown particle, which makes up the, the missing dark matter. Okay. So another plug for the Chandra X-ray satellite. We have time for three more questions. Um, I had a question about your uh, um, your model with the the Hubble and the shuttle. Yeah. The analogy. Um, the Hubble is spiraling in because it's it's transferring momentum to the shuttle, and the shuttle is spiraling out. Right. If I understand. If, if when you connect them with a the spring. Yeah. Right. When you connect them with the spring. Um, in the black hole version of that, you have the gas that's spiraling in. Um, my question is, what's spiraling out? Is there other gas that's Spiraling out. Uh, yeah, you transfer. Yeah, you transfer angular momentum from this ring out to this ring. This ring goes in. This guy takes angular momentum and transfers it out. So it's more like a bucket brigade, where the the particle, the matter in orbit is transferring angular momentum out smoothly through the disk, and eventually, you know, you're going to have something that carries it off at the outer part of the disk. In the case of a binary system, it gets transferred back into the star and into the orbital system, you know, so it makes the orbits widen over time. But, you know, it's a small effect. It's Thanks. Sure. I, you showed us um, how all the light energy gets trapped in, in the black hole as it's frozen up, and yet the uh, X-ray and um, radio frequency energy is able to escape. Could you explain to me the latter how that goes? Like yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, it escapes because it, it's coming from gas that hasn't quite made it to, into the black hole yet. So uh, there's actually, as you get closer and closer to the black hole, if you imagine sending light away, more and more of it ends up getting falling into the black hole. So as you get down closer and closer to the black hole, less of the light gets out. And so you can calculate sort of if, if this is something like emitting light here, what fraction of the light will get out? So I get closer and closer and closer. Once I get down to about one and a half times the size of the, of the Schwarzschild radius, about 50% of the light that would be emitted here is captured by the black hole. And as you get closer, more and more of it is. So if you were to actually be able to look at a disk that was emitting light, you'd see it gets bright here. And then as the gas gets closer, it begins to fade out as more and more of the light is captured. So uh, the light you see has to come from a region outside away from the black hole itself. Uh, and it's, uh, it is possible to calculate the trajectory of the light coming from the gas uh, and combine it with the, where it's being emitted. Could a, could a case be made to say that uh, a quasar is sort of a uh, natural work engine? That is to say, <laughs> obviously, a black hole uh, has you know, a tolerance
area where the shooting is dead. It's not uh, pulling. So would it then move? Or yeah. Um, there is some evidence for some jet systems that look like they're not symmetric, that the jet might be more powerful on one side compared to the other. And if that's the case, then yeah, you could uh, sort of start propelling the black hole. So people have tried to look for evidence for uh, how, you know, systems where there might be a one-sided jet or where the black hole might not be located right at the center of the galaxy. So do they, do they shoot around? Has there been any evidence <laughs> that they move around and form a faster? The places where we think we can see black holes moving around are not because the uh, because of the jet, per se, but because the, you've got one galaxy here and another galaxy here, and they come together, and they each have black holes in their cores, and then those black holes would start to orbit around each other, and eventually the black holes would come together. We haven't seen that, but so it, it'd be quite a show. Closer together and not just moving sideways? Uh, uh, yeah, they, there may be cases where you actually could fling a black hole out of a, out of a galaxy. Uh, but it's not because of the jet, it's because of gravitational interactions with other... So, so the jet has an impact on, on its own tra trajectory? Uh, it, it, again, it, it might, and again, one place, where, one place where we think that something like this does happen, it's not exactly like that, but uh, there are neutron stars which are moving at sort of ridiculously high velocities away from the galaxy. And what we think happened there is that in the supernova explosion, the explosion was off-center, and it's kind of blasted the neutron star out. And so that's kind of like an off-center jet. And you could imagine that might happen with a black hole, that in the formation process it's not symmetric. And so you get more jetting off this way, and it sort of blows the black hole out of the galaxy. Okay, um, I do see a few more hands up, but unfortunately we need to uh, end our presentation here. <laughs> And um, I guess the, the speaker will be around. We have a reception outside, um, which is sponsored by the School of Business. So uh, we don't want to wear them out too much. But um, if you do have a question for them, and um, yeah, you can may approach them nicely, and you may be able to answer during reception. So thank you very much for attending.